So today's scripture is Psalm 1. Blessed is the man who walks, walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Yes. Open a Coke. <laughs> Open happiness. <laughs> we have some Pepsi lovers here. Maybe that's why. Now, uh, this was a, a famous campaign uh, some... I mean, maybe uh, 13 years ago or so, but it has been etched in my mind ever since. And, and on one hand, just speaking from uh, just a human standpoint, just human psychology, um, just even our fleshliness, if you want to call it that, uh, it's a brilliantly, uh, you know, just we'll just call it a brilliant campaign from, from just that human perspective. And essentially, um, this company... Uh, getting underlying this very clever slogan that happiness, many things, it's for sensual, about your taste and smell and feel. Uh, certainly, if we're honest as human beings, we can identify with that. Happiness is to be consumed uh, and really underlying all that versus giving and serving others. There's some consumption going on here. Happiness is to be opened Happiness is what you find inside. And certainly we see that value uh, just played out increasingly in our culture, that happiness is something, op even open yourself up. Find your truth, speak your truth. It's inside you, find it, discover it. And maybe if we can be innocent about this ad, um, that happiness is enjoying life's simple pleasures. And certainly it's also saying that happiness can be bought. As we think about happiness, because Psalm 1 certainly does address happiness, uh, I want to help you identify your happiness. And what sort of instinctively comes as answers to these questions uh, most likely is pointing towards what you think is happiness. And so, for example, what do you naturally defend? What naturally riles you up or makes you angry? Probably behind that is something that you define as happiness in your life. What do you keep looking at? What do you keep looking at? Okay? Your answer to this, probably there's some definition of your happiness. Uh, what do you worry about? Of course, worrying doesn't make you feel happy. Worrying and anxiety actually is a terrible experience, but behind that is you worry because there's something that you want as your happiness. Uh, what are you willing to move on in relationships for? Even in my own story, there are times where just bridges have been burned. Relationships didn't pan out the way I thought. And if I'm honest, I had to kind of lay down a boundary even in that relationship, but it was because I was protecting something or I had to defend something. There was some definition of happiness that was in my life that that even allowed me to move on from relationships, okay? And of course, just what makes you smile. Just very simply put, what makes you smile? Now, Psalm 1 begins, blessed is the man. Blessed is the man. And all the commentators, I've read about five or so of them for this message, they agree that the, the Hebrew that you could, you could easily, legitimately just translate this as happy is the man. Happy. Blessedness in the Bible's uh, view of the world and God's and the way, the way he's created us 
blessedness is happiness. He wants, he created us to be happy, of course, in him and in relationship with him and without sin, mucking up our lives, uh, relationship with one another. And so this blessedness speaks to a supreme happiness. And the the psalmist is, now this is the first psalm, the banner cry to introduce all the other psalms and really a way of life And so a lot of thought and intentionality and inspiration by the Spirit is put into these psalms, uh, this Psalm 1. And to start happy, blessed is the man. Wow, what a statement by God through his servant here. Now, in fact, uh, the Hebrew word is actually a plural. And so if you wanted to translate this really technically precisely, it would be, uh, oh, the blessednesses. So even there, it just demonstrates the heart of God, how happy he wants us to be, that that he meant that. Of course, right off the bat, let's make it clear, we need to pursue happiness his way, not by our own definition, not by uh, the world's and culture's mores. And so happy is the man. And the psalmist makes it amply clear uh, that really there's only two paths as the commentators, they, they see that the, the, the Psalms, 150 books, are actually divided into five volumes, five books. And Psalm 1, as it begins this wonderful anthology of the prayers and songs of God's people, the psalmist dispels the common illusion that the worldly life, uh, black and white here, calling it the, the wicked life, those who are wicked, uh, those who are sinners, those who are scoffers. Uh, Scoffer meaning someone who is so full of arrogance and pride and thinks they know it all. Okay, a mocker. And dispelling that that life is the good life. Okay? And so there's the wicked who will not stand in the judgment. And so right off the bat, the psalmist is now already looking. He puts on eternally distanced uh, binoculars and he's looking way all the way into eternity, not just retirement, not just your next, you know, rung in the ladder in life and and what's in front of you, short term or midterm or retirement, but looking all the way to the end of life and beyond that to eternity. Because he's saying what really matters, where we really need to define happiness is at that moment of judgment before God. And so there's the wicked uh, and Of course, there are the righteous, the congregation of the righteous even. And so the happy person, the happy man, of course, is this righteous person found in the congregation of the righteous. And so uh, as a summary prayer uh, for today, what I hope, something along these lines, and of course, that the Spirit, however the Spirit stirs your heart, amen, and that's great. Uh, But if I had to offer just, one way to apply this, uh, sort of the big picture of today's passage, today's psalm, uh, that by the end, perhaps there would be something stirring your heart along these lines. Lord, convince me. Convince me of your definition of happiness. Continue to help me believe in your definition of happiness and to keep living into that. And so I want to just very basically Uh, answer the question, and hopefully it's very helpful for you. Hopefully it's clear today. Uh, How does Psalm 1 define happiness? And perhaps you can use it as a compare and contrast in your own life. Uh, Perhaps those sort of self-reflective questions at the beginnings have already started to stir some thoughts, and you just identifying, how do I honestly define happiness? Uh, And so instead, let's, let's compare and contrast that to how Psalm 1 defines happiness. So first, what happiness is not. Happiness, what happiness is not, because he first begins with a defining it in the negative. Uh, I want to summarize it this way. The opposite of happiness is not necessarily unhappiness. (laughs) Okay? The opposite of happiness is not necessarily unhappiness, because When Scripture speaks of the wicked, the sinner, the scoffer, we, at least, you know, as I try to understand 
how I grew up in this culture, and, and maybe you feel the same way. When you hear the word wicked, what, where does your mind go? The, the word is probably sensationalized. You're, you're thinking of like evil people, maybe even horror movies and, and those just graphic horror images of, of horror movie uh, trailers and, and so forth, or you're thinking of the, the, just the most heinous people in history. But for God, wickedness is much more simple and basic than that. It's not so sensationalized. It basically means an unbeliever. And there are a lot of happy unbelievers. In the moment, as they're pursuing life, there are a lot of people who have done well in life, are doing well in life, and for this life, right now, the world is at their fingertips. They can eat what they want. They can do what they want. They, can, they make their own choices. They, they are free to think how they want and so forth. So whatever their definition of happiness is, they have it. And so the opposite of happiness is not necessarily unhappiness. I want to make that a, an encouragement for you today, especially as uh, if you consider yourself a Christ follower, perhaps you are unhappy in life right now because of your circumstances or whatever reason. But it doesn't mean that you don't have to be truly, that you can still be happy in Christ, happy in the Lord. And it really depends on your definition of happiness. Now, the opposite of happiness then, I, I would say based on Psalm 1, is deliberately going down a beautiful dead end. So what is true unhappiness in the eyes of God? It's deliberately going down a dead end because the wicked will not stand in the judgment. Uh, if you've been around Trinity Grace long enough or, or heard me preach long enough, you know that one of my uh, joys and, and just gifts that I gladly receive from God is cycling. And I uh, had a chance to um, cycle in California a few times and they have beautiful valleys and so forth and I was just kind of wandering one day and was just going down this beautiful valley and this is a picture of that moment uh, and it just kept going and it was downhill as well and, and so for cyclists just going downhill feeling the breeze not just having the coast what a moment of sheer ecstasy <laughs> and taking in the beauty of the canyon and so forth and about two kilometers in, I come to a dead end. It's like, what? I thought I checked the map. This is supposed to connect to the coast. But there came a very real dead end, like even barbed wire fence and so forth. And all of a sudden, that happiness turned into, I have to climb back out two kilometers, which is not an easy task. And so trying to just connect the emotion of that moment to even a greater eternal reality. You live life thinking you're coasting, you're happy, but the definition of, the, the true opposite of happiness is you know it's a dead end, and you deliberately go down that way knowing that it's going to end not well. Okay? And so, the psalmist says, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. The psalmist is, is pleading with us, don't go down this dead end. Sure, they, the world has figured out, at least for this life, while you're here, until you're buried, until God calls you home, you can find happiness if you want. Follow the counsel of the world. Remember, desensationalize uh, the, the word wicked here. And sinner, we, we, we can just begin to really intensely dichotomize and think, but I'm not that, I'm not. No, it, it just means unbelief. A, a culture and a, a city that we live in that has so many values and ways that are not the way of God. And as one friend put it, reminded me this week, culture is more powerful than even for the strongest Christian. It's more powerful than you realize. And you're, you're drinking it in more than you realize. But the psalmist says that true happiness is, is not living the lifestyle, living the values, and, and really intentionally trying to discern the culture that we're living in. 
and not walking in that counsel. Now, as all the commentators beautifully uh, observe, and, and when I saw this for the first time, I was like, wow, that's, that's so poetic. And there's a progression here. You see that someone is walking, and now, as they continue to walk into that culture and it becomes a part of who they are, then it becomes something a bit more permanent. So they stand. They stand in that way. They kind of arrive at a place. And then as that continues to progress, it becomes even more permanent. Then where they stand and pause, then they sit. And when it says, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, and scoffer meaning here, again, let's desensationalize this word. It means someone who uh, fundamentally, I figured it out. It means an arrogance and haughtiness that, that you know and that you don't need God's way. Even for the longest uh, standing Christ follower, a genuine fruit of even someone who's walked with Jesus for 50 plus years is that there's a humility. That I still don't know everything. There's more to learn about God. There's more to, to just depend on God for. But the opposite of that is any attitude, I got this. I figured it out. And so this literally means, you could translate it in Hebrew as, nor dwells in the dwelling of those who have figured it all out. To paraphrase it even more, uh, nor has found home in the home of those who have figured it all out. Meaning, now, as they were walking and then standing, now it's really become permanent. It's become who they are, their heart. So happiness is, according to the psalmist, not the dominant culture's handbook. So to just put it another way, what's, what's the handbook for life that the world around you is trying to to offer you. Because if you live according to that handbook and trying to figure out, okay, this person, this advisor, this show, this podcast, this whatnot, you know, as I listen to it, they're suggesting to do life this way. And if I walk into that, if I live into that, then it leads to habits for life. And as you continue to cement habits, then it eventually sets a haughty heart for life and more fearfully for eternity. Because you stand before God in the judgment and your heart has been set. The decision you made, it, it, it's revealed. And so that old uh, little limerick, but full of wisdom, you sow a thought. It's the handbook for life, a way of doing life, thinking about life. You sow a thought and you eventually reap an action. You keep sowing those actions, it eventually reaps a habit. You sow a habit, it eventually reaps character. Your, your heart gets set. And you sow a certain character, and you will reap a destiny. And there are only two, as the psalmist says. So next, first we saw what happiness is not. Now I want you to see with me what I see in Psalm 1. Happiness is a choice. It truly is your choice. Yes, God is sovereign. He's even predestined, Right? It's just those words are there in Scripture. So just kind of throw it out there. But to fully unpack that sermon for another day. But we also see in Scripture intention, the reality of your choice. You have a part in all this. Happiness is a choice to joyfully be humbled before the Lord. I visited a friend's home this past week and I loved that uh, as I went into their kitchen, it wasn't this exact. They didn't have it set up this way. They had it set up another way. Um, but the same message. Uh, today, I choose joy. Meaning, it's your choice. The psalmist wants us to see that happiness, it really is your choice. And so no matter what is going on in your life, because, especially for the Christian, you are connected to, you are abiding in Christ's endless, overabundant, sufficient flow of His love and His grace, you can choose joy in Christ in spite of 
what is going on in your life. Now, to put it one way, just to, to make this more familiar and, and to make it not so distant and feel like, I can't do that. What the psalmist is going to get, and I'll show you from uh, Scripture in a second, uh, the world, in, in their psychological terms, you probably heard CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. Myself, I've gone to uh, see counselors, Christian and not, and even Christian counselors using this sort of framework to, to try to bring some change uh, at the time in my life. Now, as I got thinking about it, on one hand, it's very biblical because you think of Romans chapter 12. Um, Therefore, offer up your bodies as a spiritual uh, sacrifice. This is your, as a living sacrifice, this is your spiritual act of worship. And Paul goes on to explain, and renew your mind. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but by the renewing of your mind. So it's starting with all with what you're thinking and what you think leads to new actions, new habits, and eventually an outlook so that you can test and approve God's perfect and pleasing will. So put all the world's psychological terms aside that the principle of it is bang on with how the Spirit grows us and matures us. He renews our mind. And so in our minds that we choose Christ, we choose joy in Him, And where do we see this in Scripture then? In verse 2, he goes on to say, but now to bring, to define happiness for the God-fear, for the Christ follower positively, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. But his delight, his joy, his affections are in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. And so in this verse, is what's packed in there is our choice. But, it's a contrast. Instead of going this way, I'm going to go this way. And I choose joy in the Lord and His law. I choose to define my happiness by His word. And so the delight here is to deliberately submit yourself to God's law. Now we see this all over Scripture. This call to choose joy in Christ, in God. I could throw, like, you know, we could sit here for the next hour going through verses, but I'll just throw one at you. And, and I want you to know, uh, if you, even though we're coming on our seventh birthday this November for Trinity Grace Church, uh, even if you've been here seven years, all seven years, or you've just been here recently, and, and what we love to say is be glad, be long, be a blessing. And where do we get the whole notion of be glad? It, it's from especially the Psalms. Psalm 32, 11, A command. Be glad. This is your choice. Be glad in the Lord and rejoice. It's an imperative. It's a choice to rejoice. O righteous, and shout for joy all you upright in heart. That no matter what is going on in your life, that you're going to press in to, to see life through God's eyes and His word. So coming back to Psalm 1, verse 2, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And what does it mean to delight? It means to meditate. Not not the worldly understanding of meditation is so popular these days and mindfulness, uh, even seeping into my kids' elementary school programs and so forth and having times to to do yoga and and mindfulness and meditate. the, The world sees the benefit of being able to just calm down, try to... Quiet your thoughts. There's goodness there, but they got to go the extra step. And the psalmist knows it here. And I love that we see the word meditate in the Bible. And so we should, we should redeem this word and, and live out this true, wonderful meditation that God calls us to. And now it's different from the world's meditation. But first, what I want you to see is that to delight in the law of the Lord and in the Lord himself is to meditate on his law day and night. So first, just to begin by reading it. Reading it. Download an app if you haven't. Download a Bible software. Download. It's so easy, especially in this day and age where we have smartphones and it's the scripture and reading plans are so accessible. And you can be realistic with your schedule and, and the time that you have. You can have a, a long, dense one or you can 
be realistic and start taking baby steps, but really, especially in this day and age, that there's no excuse for us not to be in the Word and just first to begin by reading it. But of course, the Hebrew understanding of meditation here is not only reading it, but also now, as the, another psalmist says in Psalm 119, to hide, to hide his word in our heart, meaning to begin to memorize it. As Deuteronomy says, to speak it, even to murmur it under our breath. To have a verse that's, that's carrying on through the day. Our family uh, appreciates the one-year Bible. And for the kids, uh, uh, a um, chewable amount is each daily reading has one bolded verse. And so in the morning, we'll do our best to at least read that bolded verse together. And then I'll check in at the end of the day. Uh, hey, did you think about that bolded verse at all? And it's hit and miss. But they know that the question's coming at the end of the day from Dad. And, and so it slowly it's uh, built a little bit of a, a lifestyle to be thinking about it through the day. I don't know if they're coming up with an answer right on the spot, <laughs> you know, when I ask. But hey, just anything headed in the right direction. So reading it, thinking about it, beginning to memorize it and hide it in our hearts. But of course, meditation here is also to, as one commentator puts it, to exhort ourselves with Scripture. Another way to to put that, that I love saying that I picked up from another pastor, just preaching the gospel to yourself. Preaching the word to yourself. This is a holistic Christian meditation. It's not just emptying your thoughts or just trying to be calm, but to fill your entire being and to live it out through your body, to fill your entire being and then live out through your entire body the Word. That's what it means to delight. And that's so practical, isn't it? I mean, you think about anything or anyone you delight in. You think about it a lot. For honest, we're delighting in other things other than Christ and His Word. That's between you and God to to answer that question self-reflectively and honestly, perhaps even to to do a 180, to do do a a true repentance and and just be able to admit, God, I have not been delighting in you. I have been delighting in blank. So I love how William MacDonald describes the psalmist that he is a man who is separated from sin But I love that William MacDonald sees the whole of Psalm 1 and separated to the Scriptures. If it was just a man separated from sin, that will easily turn into a very uh, tedious Christianity, a legalistic Christianity, a tiresome Christianity, a, a crushing Christianity. But no, if we're separated from because something else beautiful is drawing us to and should be drawn to the Scriptures. And, and so to just hopefully give you even a, a bigger picture appreciation of the law of the Lord. What is the law of the Lord? First, just speaking of the Psalms, the Psalms are a great place to start to become familiar and acquainted with the law of the Lord because even the New Testament, uh, it, the Psalms are the most frequently cited Scriptures in the New Testament. So it's a great place to start. But even within the Psalms, as it addresses it, speaks to the law of the Lord. You want to really think from Genesis to Revelation. And there are these beautiful four aspects to the law of the Lord. There's the drama of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation. The great story and the redemptive story that God, the most epic story that God is writing in history from beginning to end. But certainly as we're uh, just... You know, as we dive into the drama of Scripture, there are doctrines, there are truth, uh, and morals and ways that we're to learn, and principles and commands. But if all of that doesn't lead you to worship, to a doxology, to, to find your, that your emotions are stoked and, and you're seeing more goodness and beauty of Christ and what He's done for you, then something's off there. And certainly the law of the Lord needs to draw out that worship. But it can't end there as well. It's meant to translate to a real life, real choices, a discipleship. 
Well, I think the psalmist also wants us to see a rootedness. That happy, if you want to be happy, you've got to be rooted. So now he transitions to this beautiful picture. The psalmist is a poet, and he gives us this beautiful picture that the blessed man, the, the man with the plural blessednesses of God in his life, as he delights in Scripture, what is he like? And he wants us to understand through this beautiful picture, he's like a tree. Think of the most solid tree you can think of. It didn't start there. It started small. But through all the seasons of life, through all that, we've got a tree in our backyard, and every time a storm flies through, strong winds, I, I'm, I'm like, ah, I should call our insurance to see you know, who covers what and what covers what, because it looks like this gigantic branch is about to just break and fall that it could any second. And you feel weary. But now think of a tree that it's weathered all the storms of life. It started small, but it's weathered all the storms. It, it, it never broke. And we see almost a uh, magical, if you will. Of course, I don't, I don't mean it in the sense of that God is magic, but, but just something supernatural. There's a supernatural picture. He is like a tree planted by streams of water. There's the first picture of, of just supernaturalness. A, a steady, unending flow of life. This is a picture of grace. This is, a, this is a picture of the gospel. There's the gospel here in Psalm 1, in this picture of the tree. This supernatural, external source of life, which is grace. That's what grace is, is it not? something from without ourselves. We couldn't do it on our own. We need God's help. And He so generously lavishes us with His salvation, His forgiveness, and His help. And so this tree has been transplanted and planted by the stream of water. And so even Jesus Himself speaking of His Spirit as streams of living water. And here's another part of the supernatural scene we see here that yields its fruit in its season. Now first here, there, there's an encouragement. In its season. Meaning there will be seasons where you don't feel so fruitful. If we take the saints of old, if we take people in the Bible, these true historical stories of God working, they had seasons of decades <laughs> So just to give some perspective, uh, to, to really try to um, paint how wide and deep and high God's grace is. Of course, we don't want to be on the side of just making excuses and say, yeah, I'm going to extend my season. <laughs> but just to know that that is how gracious God is. How much of a process there is. And in the right season, Nevertheless, that the Spirit bears His fruit in your life. And if God's grace is, is real, if you are planted by these streams of water, I want to encourage you. I want to speak with the authority of Scripture. You will yield your fruit. You will yield the fruit that your heart is longing to yield. God is working in your life. Now, this next description, and its leaf does not wither, it, it, for certain here, even more so a picture of supernatural grace. And despite perhaps lacking fruit through certain seasons, that the tree is still alive. That the tree is still living, and the, this living water is flowing through it, and God is at work in pruning it and nurturing it so that it can be fruitful. So much so that the psalmist says, in all that he does, he prospers. Now again, here it's very important to remember even within the psalm itself, the context. Context, context, context. Always when you read scripture, the context is the judgment. The context is eternity. And we have to be very disciplined not to go down the very slippery slope 
to turn Psalm 1 into some leverage or some belief that, that God, that we have our definition of prosperity during this life, that we have our definition of happiness for this life within just the, 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 the boundaries of this life alone. Because certainly if we wanted to, we could make the mistake of easily making even Psalm 1 saying, see, God will give you whatever you want according to your definition so that you are happy on your terms. No. The context is eternity and standing before God on judgment day. Now, if you're not convinced, that's why the psalmist, he quickly draws out the wicked, verse 4, and to contrast. The wicked are not so. They're not like this tree, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Again, this picture, if you just even take your anecdotal observation of life, there are a lot of unbelievers, they're doing well. They're happy. So it's not speaking of momentary, temporary life on this earth. The very antithesis, what the psalmist does want us to to understand though, of uh, rootedness, is eventually just being blown away by the wind. That's what he does want us to, this picture that he wants us uh, to take away. And so if if you're not familiar with this whole notion of chaff, and it really comes from imagery, just a farming imagery for the psalmist during his day, and it still goes on today, but taking wheat and uh, the grains that the farmer truly wants is covered by a very thin, wispy husk, and, or, or chaff, and, and so they take a pitchfork and they toss uh, the wheat up into the air, and it's so light that any breeze that comes through, it separates. And so the heavier, more substantial grain will fall to the ground, and the chaff is blown away. Now, certainly, even in this life, there are those, even some Christians, and also people who, who don't believe in Christ yet. There's just the winds of life and certain circumstances come and and you're just blown away. You're so easily discouraged, so easily tempted, so easily distracted. So even for the Christ follower, it's a good heart check. Am I rooted? Am I like this tree that's rooted in the law of the Lord, meditating on it? My definition of happiness, I'm, I'm praying the prayer, Lord, convince me of your definition of happiness. And I want to choose joy according to your definition. Are you becoming more deeply, firmly rooted in that way? Or, again, speaking to myself first, my brothers and sisters in Christ, are there times where we're just easily blown away? So certainly we can apply uh, this imagery and and this, this caution from the psalmist to even our everyday lives here and now. But, Again, context, context, context. Ultimately, the psalmist is defining happiness and being blown away by the wind like chaff from an eternal perspective. And so lastly, I think the psalmist wants us to understand if we're going to define happiness according to God's definition, happiness is holiness. Happiness is holiness. And by holiness, what we mean specifically is holiness is being counted righteous by God. Being counted righteous by God. I want to make crystal clear that when I say happiness is holiness, I'm not trying to feed into and encourage a legalistic Christianity that you have to muster up uh, your own righteousness before God. No, Apart from Christ, that's impossible. No matter how well you obey all of Scripture, you might be the most ethical person in history standing before God, but it will not be enough. And so holiness, we have to be really accurate as we understand the whole counsel of God from beginning to end. And we, as we understand the Gospel, holiness is being counted righteous by God. The righteous are not sinless, 
but they are found righteous because of Christ. That, that's the crux. That's, you boil down what it means to be a Christian. It comes down to that again and again and again, that I place my faith in Jesus and what he's done for me, his one perfect work, his one obedience, his grace on me. And therefore, I live into this wonderful joy and happiness that God loves me through Christ. He receives me. He accepts me. He's patient with me. We need to come back to that again and again and again. That's the stream of flowing water that this tree is supernaturally rooted into. And so righteous here, to put it in simple everyday terms, it just means a true believer. You believe. And by God's grace, you're trying to live out that belief. You're going to stumble and fall, but you just keep holding on to His grace. And so verse 5, the psalmist makes it clear, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment. The psalmist makes the context black and white clear, crystal clear. He's defining happiness from an eternal perspective. And so in that moment of judgment, on that judgment day, happiness will be holiness. That is the definition of happiness that will stand. Meaning you are counted righteous by God because of Christ and your faith in Him and His righteousness on you. And you'll be able to look back on a life that was trying to live in response to that. And so the psalmist makes it amply clear no uncertain terms, for the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked, the unbeliever, will perish ultimately in eternity. Now, on the hopeful side, the righteous. Now, first notice here the congregation of the righteous. Even in the Old Testament, God had a vision, and the Spirit inspired the psalmist to see this beautiful picture of the church. It's not just individual Christianity, but we need to do this together. And we need each other's help to keep encouraging one another. Hey, don't give up on God's definition of happiness. Don't give up on this. And let's, as much as the world is trying to define and give us a different handbook, let's keep living into these wonderful habits of following Jesus and defining happiness on God's terms. And so there's the congregation of the righteous And this beautiful imagery here, the Lord knows, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. This word knows, it's the deepest knowledge of someone that you can have. Even so much so that this word for know is also used in context for when a husband and wife are together. For the marriage bed. And that's how, even beyond the intimacy between husband and wife, the Lord knows the way of the righteous. He knows you. He sees you. So the real question for you and me is, uh, does God know you? Does God know you? Now, again, to avoid making this about us, the more important follow-up question is, do you know Jesus? Because if you are united to Jesus, then you can have full confidence that He knows you. God knows you. And as Augustine, St. Augustine and other commentators, even contemporary commentators, I guess agreeing with Augustine, they have the insight that the blessed man ultimately in Psalm 1 is first and foremost Jesus himself. Jesus is the blessed man. Jesus walked. He didn't walk in the way of uh, the, the, the counsel of the wicked. He didn't stand in the way of sinners. He walked in the way of his Father, in the counsel of the Spirit and the Scriptures. And certainly, In a good way, he stood in the way of God. 
And what I want you to see is that he certainly did not sit. He did not sit in the way of scoffers. And even before God, there was this constant humility, the, the dependence, the ultimate example of being humble before God to the point of death on a cross. And it's this Jesus who promised streams of living water. It's this Jesus that is known by the Father. And his promise to all those who believe is that you know me, my Father will know you. And you'll be found in the family, the congregation of the righteous. So John Stott, he adds wisely that this delight in the law of the Lord, it's an indication of the Spirit's work. The Spirit regenerates our hearts and, and we we're willing to even begin to redefine our happiness and to delight in the Lord. And so, um, I, I hope that there will be something similar to this prayer in your heart, in my heart, even now. Uh, and so if we could end this time, if, if it's in your heart, just say the simple prayer with me. Lord, convince me your definition of happiness.